Eric wrote back to say, I hadn't seen Fight Club in a long time, but I found the Wikipedia article and refreshed my memory. I agree that the authors of The Rebel Cell didn't really do the end of that movie justice. I had an interesting discussion here with some friends about whether even an attack of that magnitude would actually strike an effective blow against the system. Opinions are mixed. It's a very complicated issue, but we mostly agree that the 10 year afterwards picture doesn't really look any different. Even if you assume the best case scenario for the attack, i.e. the credit data is actually fully destroyed, many millions get debt jubilee, while the banks themselves suffer tremendous losses, with many going bankrupt. Basically, the system rebuilds itself. The people go back to using credit cards for the same reasons they used them the first time, and soon enough, it's as if nothing happened. The system is resilient, because the dynamics that create it are all bottom up, each person acting on their own. You can see credit cards as another type of competitive consumption mechanism, which results in a race to debt slavery as each person competes with others to own distinctive goods. Merely blowing up the buildings slash data doesn't fix anything. What's needed is some kind of arms control agreement whereby everyone agrees that credit cards are bad and no one is allowed to use them. Only such a universal agreement can work, because otherwise individual incentives to cheat eventually result in the same race to the bottom. That's the logic of the rebel cell that impressed me. This idea that you can't solve problems with the system by attacking the system, which is a result. You can only solve them by addressing the collective action behavioral problems, which are the cause. And that can't be done with countercultural consciousness raising. It can only be done at the collective societal norms level that government works at because the problems are caused by rational actions of each participant responding to the other participants. You can't free your mind to solve the problem. In fact, the solution is precisely to restrict your possible options in return for society-wide benefits accruing to everyone due to the now restricted competition. That's a fairly dense paragraph. I've read it many times, and it was several readings before I really think I took the meaning from it. But what Eric is saying there and he is paraphrasing the authors of The Rebel Cell, is that you can't change the world by changing your consciousness. You have to participate at the level of societal organization at which governments and corporations preside. You have to play on their playing field in order to have any lasting effect because all of the effects are bottom up. They are not legislated ends. They are things that come from the basic starting conditions. And the only way to change those starting conditions is to change the rules which govern behavior. And now for the exact opposite narrative. Here is my most recent conversation with Neil Kramer. You're listening to the C Realm Podcast. C stands for consciousness. You are listening to the C Realm Podcast. I am your host, KMO. And I'm joined once again by a Sea Realm favorite, a repeat guest on the podcast, Neil Kramer. Neil, welcome back to the Sea Realm podcast. Well, hello, KMO. It's excellent to be here once more. Neil, I have had a request from a listener to take a breather from the gloom and doom of the Sea Realm podcast and focus on the positive, focus on what people can do not to prepare for catastrophe, but just to sort of embrace life and discover what their purpose is and really engage with it. I think that's what people need to do, and it can be done, as I've said many times, cheaply. So the fact that we might be coming to a period where materially things seem quite thin, you know, stretched, taut, we have lots of opportunity to really live better, more engaging, more satisfying lives. And I think you are an excellent person to speak to that subject. Well, yes, hopefully I can uh, inject a bit of empowerment into things. That's usually what I sort of seek to do. So I do like to frame things in the sense that I do believe in the human endeavor and I do think it's a worthwhile uh, activity. And largely on my travels and on my own thoughts and my own interactions and so on, by and large, most people are good and most people want the same kind of things, and most people feel the same kind of uh, reactions and difficulties about what's going on in the world. And I think that there's something important in that. And a key theme 
that's recurrent in my work is, is really this idea of, of dissonance, both cognitive and emotional, uh, philosophical, energetic, whatever. And that really, I think, is something that has become, I don't know, a little bit more prescient, a little bit more pressing as well in terms of what a few years ago was quite abstract and quite um, quite just theorised about really by listeners and forum members and podcasters and writers and so on, is really kind of sliding into the mainstream now. And I think that dissonance is felt by not only informed observers, but also just really casual observers and, quite frankly, uninformed observers as well. So anybody who looks at what's going on in the news and the newspapers and the internet and so on, with governments and the Middle East and the wars and the finance state of the economy, etc., it is very negative looking and people are just scratching their heads. And I think really it stems from we, we have an idea, this is where dissonance comes from, we have an idea, a perceptual framework, a belief uh, that we live in a freely elected democratic nation and you know the people who administrate our democracies the, the governments and the think tanks and institutions and so on are there to fairly and properly represent the people us the civilian population and unfortunately that simply isn't true and no matter how you look at it and how deeply and how analytically you scratch away at this thing and chip away into the the substance of it that is the case, that that actually isn't true. We don't live in that kind of world. And in my view, we never have done. And so for me to break through the polarity of seeing things as good or bad or ideologically, optimistically, unrealistic or doomily, gloomily, let's all cull the whole population and give the earth a breather. I don't think any of those two are particularly credible or viable or very sensible thoughts actually and for me the whole thing begins with a realization and we have to see something as it is not as a belief and not as a thought or an idea but as it is and so because of the dissonance that we we, we perceive when we look at things through this this group lens this this group reality tunnel it is kind of natural to um, aim our indignation if you like, or to, to diffuse our, our dissonance by criticising the current bunch of administrators. So right now, of course, Obama, Cameron, Merkel, Sarkozy, Netanyahu, whoever, the, the, the figureheads of these, of these systems of governance. And it's easy to do that because they're always rubbish, essentially. And slightly older people, typically, uh, you know, the generation and a half or up, they will think, well, it's very tempting to think it was much better in the days of Thatcher and Reagan, if you're a conservative, or Blair and Bush, although that might be a bit of a stretch in anybody's book, actually. But, you know, depending on your age, Eisenhower, Kennedy, Churchill, Macmillan, Harold Wilson, all, all these figures from the 50s and 60s and 70s and so on, that things were better then and things were, were different then. And in my view, that what you're seeing there really is a, is a sort of, paucity, a real lack of abundance of, no of knowledge and of information. And the dream was much more saturated then in the 50s. And so things did seem a lot better, but in actual fact, they're exactly the same as they are now, in my view, at a conscious level and at a political level. And there was still the same shenanigans and still the same um, insidious behaviour that there is today. It's just that it was there was no mass media and there was no instant communication, so it was much, much easier to cover up. So anyway, the realisation is a simple one, that what we dwell within is a system of governance based on resource management. That's what it's about. And we're part of that resource, but it's also abstract resources like um, money and futures trading and systems of um, economic uh, statistical charting that bear very little resemblance to reality whatsoever, and also minerals and obviously oils and fossils and all the rest of it. And 
really, whether you want to look at this from a, a geopolitical perspective or realpolitik or 